Uncle Walt. We finally tracked him down on the studio street. Walt Disney. Master of fantasy, weaver of dreams, and winner of 29 Academy Awards. When I tried to latch on to this trip around the studio, he said, This is for us kids only. You take the picture. But I hitched a ride in the rumble seat. For my two little girls, this must have seemed like a ride on a flying carpet. Well, I uh, came to Hollywood and arrived here in August 1923 with uh, $40 in my pocket and uh, a coat and a pair of trousers that didn't match. And uh, one half of my suitcase had my shirts and, uh, and, uh, and underwear and things. The other half had my, my drawing materials. <laughs> we, uh, it was we a cardboard suitcase <laughs> at that. We don't think of you in terms of the silent picture era. What did, what did you do when you finally got out here? Well, I uh, I tried to get uh, tried to get a job uh, doing anything I could in the studio so I could learn. I was a little discouraged with the cartoon at that time. I felt at that time that I was getting into it too late. In other words, I thought the cartoon business was established in such a way that uh, there was no chance to break into it. So I tried to get a job in Hollywood, uh, working uh, in the picture business so I could learn it. I, I uh, would have liked to have been a director or any part of that. And uh, I, there was uh, nothing open, so before I knew it, I had my drawing board out and I started to back at the cartoon. And I was able to secure a contract for fifth, no, 12 of these short films. And I did all the drawing myself. I, did, uh, I had no help at all. I was all alone, but I made the first uh, six practically alone. Then uh, uh, at that time, I was able to get some of the boys that had been with me in Kansas City to come out. So on, from the seventh on, I had some help. And uh, I got by the first year. And they were fairly successful, and that led to other things. And uh, with the, uh, some of the boys I'd worked with in Kansas City, uh, augmenting the setup, I was able to eventually build an organization. And it reached a point that I had so many, uh, well, working with me and uh, so much time and attention to, demanded that I had to drop dr the drawing end of it myself. But I've never regretted it because uh, drawing was always a means to an end with me. And... Uh, so through these other boys who were good draftsmen and artists in many different uh, phases of business, very talented people, I've coordinating their talents is what has built this business. And if I hadn't dropped the drawing end of it myself, I don't think I'd have built this organization. When did you um, establish your own company? What year was that then? 1923. My brother is here. In effect, the government helped subsidize us, and I'll explain that to you. Uh, my brother was a veteran of the First World War, and he had uh, been hospitalized and things, and so he was receiving a certain uh, uh, disability uh, compensation that amounted to about $85 a month, and we lived on that while we established the studio. And from that time on, my brother Roy and I have been together in this business. And until the year 1940, we didn't have a stockholder. Now, when was Mickey Mouse born? Mickey Mouse came about in 1928. With, a, with sound, I presume. Well, no, the first Mickey Mouse was made silent. And while we were making the first Mickey Mouse, sound came. So we uh, decided that uh, there's no sense in making anything more silent. And we immediately switched to sound. And we didn't have any sound equipment or anything else. But we went ahead and made them for sound. And we eventually got sound on them. And, of course... It, uh, I think, played the, the big part in establishing Mickey Mouse. Where did the idea for Mickey come from? Well, it came about through a, a situation that uh, uh, I was contracting with a middleman for my films, and they were being released through Universal. And uh, he was a rather unscrupulous character, and he, uh, he thought he could uh, cut in and move in a little better, and, uh, and I pulled away from him. And I was left alone, and he happened to own the character. He had a right to the character. So that was one of the 
one of the big lessons I learned. And from then on, I said, there's no middleman. He contributed nothing. We did everything. So I had to get a new character. And I'd been doing a rabbit. It was called Oswald the Rabbit. I did and started for him. So I had to have a new character. And I was coming back after this meeting in New York. And Mrs. Disney's with me. It was on the train in those days, you know. And there's three days, over three days from New York. And I said, we've got to get a new character. And I always, uh, well, I'd fool around a lot with the little mice. Uh, and they were always cute characters. And they hadn't been overdone in the, in the picture field. They'd been used but never featured. So I, I decided it would be with a mouse because uh, at that time I didn't have Mickey as a more or less a normal scale uh, human being. I had him as a scaled mouse with with uh, overscaled props, and uh, that's how it came about. It's kind of like uh, uh, oh, and then the name came. What would you call him? And the euphony there, Mickey Mouse. And, I had a Mortimer first, and my wife shook her head, and then I tried Mickey, and she said, nodded the other way, and that was it. Is it true that uh, you did the voice for Mickey yourself in the early days? Oh, yeah, I still do it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you if you could, and you still can. <laughs> well, it's just the falsetto, and, and we were fooling around and uh, trying to get a voice for a mouse, and nobody knew what a mouse would sound like, so uh, I said, well, it's kind of like this. And the guy said, well, why don't you do it? And, <laughs> and I knew I'd always be on the payroll, so ha, I did it. When was uh, Donald Duck born? <laughs> well, Donald came about uh, four or five years after Mickey Mouse. And uh, I heard the voice on the, on the radio. It was a, a, almost an amateur uh, program. And this uh, boy was imitating animals and things and birds and uh, he had this little gag that he ended his act with about the little duck he had a girl duck yeah. reciting mary had a little lamb and it was that odd voice and i immediately got in touch with the radio station they didn't even know who he was he'd gone i've traced him down and found he was working for a dairy and he was doing little lectures during the schools on bird life wearing the uniform of this dairy advertising the milk yeah. an indirect way of getting their advertising and he'd move to his classrooms and tell him about the birds and the, the, how the metal arc had sound and all of that. So uh, it was a, he wasn't making much money, and uh, I said, well, I can pay you a little more than they're paying if you want to come over here, and we'll find out what we can do with that voice. So he was here on the payroll for about a year before I... The thing that kept throwing me all the time was a girl duck. And finally, uh, I said, well, it don't have to be a girl. It can be a, a, a boy duck, you know? So uh, we uh, ended up with uh, Donald. What about um, all the other characters like Pluto? And uh, Did you think of these yourself? Or is it sort of a joint? Well, they evolved. Thing? Now, Pluto, we were doing a, a short with Mickey Mouse. I think it was called The Chain Gang, where that uh, he escaped from uh, prison and uh, they sent the hounds after him. And one of these hounds, we were fooling around with this hound. It was on the trail, this uh, runaway mouse. And we, out of that came this uh, funny hound character. And from there on, we said, well, we, we can use him. And before we knew it, we had him in as Mickey's pal. And we had uh, changed him a little bit from the hound. But that's how it started. All of them will spring out of something. Now, the Donald Duck came from this voice. Then we tried to find a character. Then I had a little subject coming where I, I uh, used a duck, and it was Donald. And from there on, he blossomed out. The family grew yeah. Where are they all now? Oh, they're, uh, they're very active right now. We do an awful lot with them in television. And we do do a certain number of short uh, features to uh, accompany our uh, longer features. Mickey is still working in. Oh, yeah. We're very, very happy to know that. He's 30 years old now. <laughs> That's a pretty old mouse, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, he's, uh, he's, I think he, uh, through the years, he's got, uh, he's a more, better constructed mouse than he ever was, I think. Of course, that man is Mr. Walt Disney. It's a real pleasure, sir, to talk with you. Well, nice to talk to you, Dick. Under the banner of WED Enterprises, which incidentally stands for Walter Elias Disney, Mr. Disney has produced four major exhibits at the fair for Ford Motor Company, General Electric, and the state of Illinois. WED also designed a fourth exhibit, Pepsi-Cola, which was constructed and will be operated by Walt Disney Productions. What is WED Enterprises, Mr. Disney? 
Is this the same group of talented people that designed Disneyland? Well, Wed is a, you might call it my backyard laboratory, you know, my workshop away from work. It served a purpose in that some of the things I was planning, like Disneyland, for example, it was pretty hard to, for the banking mind to go with it. I had to go ahead on my own and develop it to a point where that they could begin to comprehend what I had in mind. So it's been true with a lot of things in, the, in our history here that we've been doing something that's a little bit out of the run of things, and it's pretty hard to sell people on what you have in your mind. So you have to go ahead and develop it. And that's what I've been doing with WED. I can do things at WED without asking anybody, even my wife. She's hard to sell lots of things. <laughs> like uh, space age development, many of your contributions have introduced new words uh, to our vocabulary. But your most recent is audio animatronic. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's, uh, you know, sound, uh, animation through electronics. It's opened a whole new door for us. We can program whole shows on a tape. This little tape sends signals, and the little figures go to work, and they uh, sing and act and move according to the impulse that comes from the tape. And uh, this has all uh, been possible because of this big drive that we've had on the, on the space age development, the electronic age. You're using audio animatronics for all four exhibits, like we mentioned before. What are some of the specific effects of each exhibit? How would you like each one to affect fair visitors? They all tie in with the theme of the World's Fair. It's uh, progress. Like the General Electric show, for example, we have what we call the carousel of progress. You now it's a theater that revolves, the people revolve around six stages. And on each one of these stages uh, are my audio animatronic figures that enact a little uh, part of the whole story. And we start with the pre-electrical age, we had coal lamps and all that, coal lamp, and we go up to early electrical, mid-electric, and then up to today and what you can do with electricity in your home. But the the audience itself revolves around these fixed stages. And it's called the Carousel Theater of Progress. And I want to tell you about my Pepsi Cola show. This took a lot of imagineering too. It's a tribute to the to the children of the world. And it's a little fantasy where you take a trip around the world of children in a boat. And you visit all the different countries with all the different children of these countries in their costumes. And then, and then a lot of toy-like figures to represent other things. And these little figures dance and sing and uh, finally end up with a big finale, which is like the finale in any musical where all the children from these other lands that you visited are all together in one, all singing in unison. And uh, it's a big spectacular finish. It's called It's a Small World. With the Ford exhibit, we take them in a Ford product and they ride back in time. They go back to the primeval days of the... Uh, big uh, giant lizards, dinosaurs and brontosauruses and uh, stegosauruses and all of that. And they're all animated and moving, very lifelike. They move from that up to the, to the early age of man. And we show that how, how man was learning to better his way of life, where he learned how to use fire, where he learned to build weapons. And you'll meet for the first time the fellow who invented the wheel. He's a caveman. He's got this wheel, and he's trying to sell it to his neighbors, and he's having an awful hard time. You know, they, <laughs> they don't believe the darn thing's worth anything, you know. So then we go into the fantasy of the world of tomorrow. In the Ford product, you ride right through, more or less like a skyway. And then we come back to, to today, and the Ford has a wonderful show of their product today and how it's designed and all of that. I think the Ford exhibit is going to be one of the top exhibits at the fair. So one other oh, my Lincoln? I think that uh, people are going to be surprised how lifelike uh, this Abraham Lincoln is going to be. When they're going to sit in there and listen to this great man who gives a speech on liberty. And these are the speeches taken from Abraham Lincoln's own writings and speeches. And he's in a very dignified setting. And uh, the audience is conditioned and then they're presented to the president, and he stands up and addresses this audience. Well, by the way, on the Lincoln figure, uh, we've done considerable research so that we uh, really could create a lifelike uh, impression of Lincoln. We're fortunate in being able to secure a life mask that was made of Lincoln. It was made in about 1860, I think. 
And it gave us a chance to know the, his real, the contour of his face and all of that. And then my research, we found all of his mannerisms. We got, selected a voice that fit the closest to what was described as uh, Lincoln's voice and also how he used to start his speech. He'd started rather high, then as he got into his speech, he would come down and, and uh, modulate his voice a little more carefully. He was a fellow who could get rather emotional in the middle of a speech, too. So, uh, we... I actually started to uh, plan the picture about 1935, and I fool around with it, uh, trying to get a hold of a story and things for a couple of years, and finally it began to gel, then I uh, went to work on it, and I finished it the fall of 1938. And I didn't know what I had, or what would happen, or anything, we had the, the family fortune, we had everything wrapped up in Snow White. In fact, the, the banker, I think, was losing more sleep than I was, and fortunately they go away, we put it in, premiered it, and everything else, why, everything was, was fine. Anchor was happy. And the following spring, along came that Academy Award. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. But, uh, parts. It wasn't <laughs> but about two years later that I was almost broke. Well, <laughs> well, two years later Again. was uh, following Pinocchio and coming into the Fantasia. Period. Yeah, that about did it, you know. <laughs> that, but that was a artistic new Artistic success, one. financial failure. Uh -huh. Certainly an artistic success, it was. Well, it, uh, it, some people would uh, would question that too. And I, I recall a, a new and, and musical Mickey, really impressive as a conductor. Well, that's what started. I was uh, doing this uh, uh, Sources Apprentice with Mickey Mouse, and I happened to have dinner one night with Stokowski. Stokowski said, "Oh, I would love to conduct that for you." You know. Well, that led to not only doing this one little short subject, but it got us involved where I did all of Fantasia, and before I knew it, I ended up spending 400 and some odd thousand dollars getting music with Spakovsky. <laughs> well, <laughs> but we were in that, it was a point of no return, we would have made it. But it was certainly worth it every foot of the way. Well, he's a great guy, though. I don't want to belittle Spakovsky, but uh, he, he is a great musician, a great artist. Well, perfectionism always costs money, I guess. That's certainly something you've always had. Well, I was always known as the perfectionist until I met Spakovsky. <laughs> And you had a new member of the club. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Walt Disney received the award from Walt Disney Studio. This is a group effort. This is a group effort. Uh, the many men play a part in doing, creating these effects. And it is for them that I accept this award. Thank you. I wondered why I drove up in that truck. say on behalf of my staff and especially the, the naturalist photographers who have played such a great part in making the nature films, many, many thanks. year to retire.
So uh, we've done everything we can to create the most lifelike image of Lincoln, more so than I think any actor could ever do. It's a big fair. I think uh, people are going to be surprised. It's really an exciting thing. I was there just a few weeks ago. It's going to be the biggest fair, I think, yet, without a doubt. The New York World's Fair sounds like an experience of a lifetime, and I'm sure that no one who goes there is likely to forget it. Thank you so much, Walt Disney, for being our guest. Uh, thank you, Dick. This is Dick Strout with World's Fair Report, returning you to our main studios. crazy trying to draw all those characters in the art. That's right. We need a change of pace. You know, something simple, just three or four characters. Well, how about the one we've always wanted to do and never got around to, the three little pigs? Well, offhand, I don't get much out of those pigs. Well, well you got something simple. Four characters, three pigs and a wolf. Yeah, the wolf would make a great heavy. Well, here's the one that one. Open the door or I'll bust it in. If you don't, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Yeah. Are you mean that going? Yeah, it turns blue in the face. Yeah. Hey, he can lose his pants. <laughs> Ted, it's a good story. It's timely, and not only that, it's timeless. And we can, they won't be ordinary pigs. We'll, we'll do some, give them personalities. The two gay giddy pigs, we'll, you know, we dress them up like sailors. Or something. Well, they could uh, laugh at their practical brother. Hey, yeah. how about getting a tune in this one, too? You know, something to express the theme? You mean simple, like with kids in school, they go, Who's the pig the wolf? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we need yeah. something more with a beat in it. Yeah, they get tired of that before the picture's over. we got to have something that, uh, well, expresses the theme. Frank. Frank. Oh, oh, oh. Wait a minute. Get the idea first. The theme is pigs. Haven't you got something, a uh, pig duty of some kind? Let's put it in four four time. Yeah, something like a dance to Frank. I see one of pigs with a fiddle. Maybe the other one was a flute. Yeah, that's good. We'd better get a lyric writer in on this. Oh, no, let's keep it simple. <laughs> okay, what's your first line? Well, uh, you know, the brother's always warning about the wolf, so it'd be, uh, who's afraid of the wolf or something. How about who's afraid of the big old wolf? No, oh, it'd be big bad wolf. Okay. That's better. Now, what comes next? What rhymes uh, with wolf? Well, what's wrong with wolf? Yeah, let's repeat it. Sure. Right. It's gonna work. Let's try it, huh? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Big bad wolf. Big bad wolf. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? You know. Okay, that's good. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Big bad wolf. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? us a lot. When the picture was finished, we found we had repeated the phrase, who's afraid of the big bad wolf, some 20 times. <laughs> now, I promised to tell you how this old piano literally played an important part in the birth of another of our animated films, Peter and the Wolf. One of the great modern composers, the late Sergei Prokofiev, played his musical fantasy for me on this very piano. Now that was a long time ago, back in 1938. Here's a room, I'm afraid it isn't much for piano though. Don't worry, Wally, it'll do. To make matters worse, Mr. Prokofiev spoke very little English, and of course, I spoke no Russian. Every day, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. And tomorrow's just a dream away. Man has a dream, and that's the start. He follows his dream with mind and heart. And when it becomes a reality, it's a dream come true for you and me. So there's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. There's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow, just a dream away. Well, it sounds pretty good. In fact, that's just the right spirit. Our songwriters, Dick 
from Bob Sherman of the Walt Disney Studio. The Sherman brothers have written many of the wonderful songs for motion pictures and television shows, and I think this song, written especially for you, captures the spirit of the General Electric Pavilion at the New York World's Fair. Thanks, boys. Thanks, boys. Say goodbye to the folks. Bye-bye. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow. <laughs> As I said, that's the spirit. Well, a beautiful tomorrow just a dream away. That says we're going places. There's progress ahead. And that's just the mood we want for the whole pavilion. The pavilion you will see next April is the result of the combined talents and creative ideas of many people. You have a wonderful building designed by Welton Beckett and Associates. The entire Disney team has been called on to develop entertaining and exciting attractions. The design talents of Wet Enterprises, all the special skills of our key personnel here at the Walt Disney Studio, and eight years of experience in creating attractions and being a good host to nearly 40 million people at Disneyland. And your New York World's Fair staff has worked closely with us to assure that the overall theme and each individual area of the pavilion will accomplish General Electric's goals at the fair. We think you will be happy with the results. But more important, we think your guests will be excited about the entertainment, the exhibits, and especially about the General Electric Company. Why? Because what we're attempting to do is is to create unique attractions for every part of your pavilion at the fair. Here, for example, is a a scale model of the General Electric Carousel Theater, a theater in which the audience itself moves in their seats around the stages. The actors, well, they're not real people, but they are a talented and interesting cast. We call them audio animatronic figures, and they talk and act like human beings. The Carousel Theater will present a warm and entertaining portrayal of how life has changed through electrical energy. The same kind of exciting and unique entertainment is what we're planning for every area of the General Electric Pavilion. So, see you at the fair, and remember... There's a great big beautiful tomorrow Shining at the end of every day There's a great big beautiful tomorrow Just a dream away Your attention please The Disneyland Limited Now arriving from a trip around Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom Passengers will stand by to board. Your attention, please. The Disneyland Limited, now leaving for a complete trip around Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom through the Grand Canyon and Primeval World, stops at Mickey's Toontown, Tomorrowland, and Main Street Station. Last call. Boy. To those who just joined us, welcome aboard the Disneyland Railroad. To ensure a safe ride, remember to stay seated with your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the train. And please, watch your kids. Para su seguridad. Permanezca sentado y mantenga las manos, brazos, pies y piernas dentro del tren. Y cuide a los pequeños. Gracias. We're now entering Splash Mountain, where every day is a zippity doo dah day. If you look real hard, you might just find your laughing place. We are now passing over Critter Country, where Winnie the Pooh, Tigger, Br'er Rabbit, and Br'er Bear make their homes and embark on fun-filled adventures. Although this land was made for critters, human-type folks are always invited to stop in to visit a spell. We're traveling along the rivers of America and into the American frontier as it looked more than a century ago. This area is so rich with natural beauty and wildlife, 
you can see why the early settlers were inspired to move west. You're seeing this view just like many of them did, from the comfort of a genuine steam-powered train. When these iron horses first started crisscrossing the country in the 1800s, the time it took folks to reach the west dropped from months to a matter of days. Why, steam power not only fueled the trains, but the dreams of a whole new generation as they settled this great frontier. Say, have you ever wondered what it would be like to visit the cartoon town where Mickey, Minnie, Donald, and Goofy live? Well, in just a few moments you can find out for yourself, because our next stop is Toontown Depot, official train station for Mickey's Toontown. This is also the nearest stop to Fantasyland, where you'll find many of your favorite Disney animated characters. This model shows only a small section of Disneyland's new adventure, the primeval world. When we started to recreate the huge animals that roamed the Earth 200 million years ago, we started with these one-inch scale figures. Then we worked our way straight up to their actual sizes. Some are 22 feet tall. You know, nature wasn't creating household pets in that era. Now, to give realism and life to these prehistoric giants, we applied the art of animatronics, which give them three-dimensional animation. So now, let's go back 200 million years to the primeval world. It's just a short trip on the Disneyland Santa Fe Railroad. Your attention, please. The Disneyland Limited, now arriving from a trip around Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom. Passengers will stand by to board. Your attention, please. The Disneyland Limited, now leaving for a complete trip around Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom through the Grand Canyon and Primeval World. Stops at Tomorrowland, Main Street Station, and Frontierland. Last call. Boy! Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the Disneyland Railroad. For a safe ride, remember to stay seated with your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the train. And please, watch your kids. ¿Qué tal, amigos, y bienvenidos a bordo? Para su seguridad, permanezca sentado y mantenga las manos, brazos, pies y piernas dentro del tren. Y cuide a los pequeños. Gracias. As we steam on through Fantasyland, you may want to take one more look at the majestic Matterhorn Mountain and the happiest cruise that ever sailed. It's a small world. Folks, ahead of us lies the future. Well, I guess we all know that. What I mean to say is, we're heading into Tomorrowland, where everything is possible. If you look overhead, you might catch a glimpse of a Mark V monorail. When Disneyland introduced the monorail back in 1959, it was the first daily operate monorail system in the entire Western Hemisphere. Winding below us is the Autopia, where drivers of all ages can get behind the wheel of a car, and no license is required. If you've ever wanted to become an astronaut, then you might want to stop at Space Mountain and Star Tours, where they got some new newfangled flying spaceships that launch you into the deepest reaches of space. And you can ride them if you got the mind <laughs> and the nerve. Well, folks, we're now arriving at Tomorrowland Station. If you'll be leaving us here, just stay seated till we come to a full stop. Gather your belongings and step carefully from the train. Thanks. Have fun in the future. For the rest of you, just sit tight. We'll be on our way again in just a minute. Well, it came about when my daughters were very young, and I, Saturday was always uh, Daddy's Day with the two daughters. 
So we'd start out and try to go someplace with, you know, different things. And I would take them to the merry ground, and I took them different places. And as I'd sit there while they, uh, they rode the merry ground, did all these things, sit on a bench, you know, eating peanuts, I felt that there should be something built, some kind of a, an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together. So that's how Disneyland started. Well, it took many years. It was a, a whole period of maybe 15 years developing. We uh, started with many ideas, threw them away, started all over again. Eventually it evolved into what you see today as Disneyland. But it all started from a daddy with two daughters wondering where he could take them, where he could have a little fun with them, too. <laughs> well, about it is Walt Disney. Welcome. I guess you all know this little fella here. It's an old partnership. Mickey and I started out the uh, first time many, many years ago. We've had a lot of our dreams come true. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. That's it, right here. Disneyland, seen from about 2,000 feet in the air and 10 months away. I want to tell you about it because Later on in the show, you'll find that Disneyland the place and Disneyland the TV show are all part of the same. Now, on a site of uh, 240 acres near the city of Anaheim in Southern California, right about in here, we've begun to build Disneyland the place. We hope that it will be unlike anything else on this earth. A uh, fair, uh, amusement park, an exhibition, a city from the Arabian Nights, metropolis from the future. In fact, a place of hopes and dreams, facts and fancy, all in one. Now, next year, our television show will be coming from this Disneyland. But this year, we want you to see and share with us the experience of building this dream into a reality. This is a quarter inch to the foot scale model of Disneyland. When you come in the main gate, past the railroad station, down the steps and across the band concert park, Straight ahead lies the heartline of America, an old-fashioned Main Street. Hometown USA, just after the turn of the century. America was growing fast. Towns and villages were turning into cities. Soon the gas light will be replaced by electricity. But that was still in the future. At this time, Little Main Street was still the most important spot in the nation. Combining the color of frontier days with the oncoming excitement of the new 20th century. Now at the foot of Main Street, about where you're sitting, is the plaza. The plaza, or the hub, is the heart of Disneyland. Shooting out from here, like the four cardinal points of the compass, Disneyland is divided into four cardinal realms. The four different worlds from which our television shows will originate. They are... Adventureland, Tomorrowland, Fantasyland, and Frontierland. Our last realm is Fantasyland. We cross the moat through Sleeping Beauty's castle into the world of imagination. Once here, we can fly with Peter Pan to Neverland, wander with Alice through Wonderland, Ride Cinderella's pumpkin coach. In fact, anything your heart desires. Because in this land, hopes and dreams are all that matter. We hope that through our television shows that you will join us and take part in the building of Disneyland. And that you will find here a place of knowledge and happiness. Thank you, Bob Cummings, for that word picture. But right now, we got to get back here. The E.P. Ripley is rolling around the Santa Fe Disneyland ra railroad tracks with Walt Disney at the controls, and in the cab with him, you may be surprised to know, is the governor of the state of California and the president of Santa Fe, Mr. Gurley himself. And in the cars behind the 5-8 size train, you'll see the little boys and girls dressed in the foreign costumes of their countries because they are the children of the foreign consuls located here in Los Angeles. Now, the track is a mile and a half around. The train runs about every 10 or 12 minutes. In fact, there are two trains. There's a passenger train and there's a freight train. And each one can take several hundred passengers. It takes about uh, six minutes to go around the track, which is built on a ramp that completely encircles Disneyland and cuts it out 
from the outside world. So once you get inside Disneyland, all you see are the various kingdoms. Now if you look on down the track, you see Mickey Mouse there at the controls. And that's an exact duplicate of the engines that ran over 50 years ago. You can see the conductor there with his brass buttons glistening in the sun, the arms of the children. Hello, Walt. Hello, Governor. Hi. Hi. How'd the run go? Oh, fine, fine. The Governor had her around through frontier land, and then Fred Gurney there, he took her around. I picked her up and brought her in. Hi, Walt. Hello, Hello, Governor. Glad to see you. Our Governor Knight of California, ladies and gentlemen, and Walt Disney, of course, and Mr. Gurley, the president of the Santa Fe. And of the Santa Fe and Disneyland, if you please. <laughs> That's right. Now, Vice President of Santa Fe and Disneyland. <laughs> you gentlemen have lots to do down in the square, so we'll see you at the dedication. All right. All right. Thank you, Lord. All right. There they go. And here come a lot. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Bunny. Johnny Green. Ron Button. And all the passengers. And uh, I've got to get down and start uh, getting ready to cover the parade, which is going to go down Main Street in a couple of seconds. All activity on Main Street has ceased. Those carriages which have lined up for the parade to follow are full of celebrities. Walt Disney, Governor Knight, the mayor of Anaheim, and other dignitaries are talking to the three chaplains representing the Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish faith. And now... Walt Disney will step forward to read the dedication of Disneyland. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. Here age relives fond memories of the past. And here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future. Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. Thank you. Before you enter this realm, I'd like to read this dedication, which will be inscribed on a plaque. Frontierland, it is here that we experience the story of our country's past. The color, romance, and drama of frontier America as it developed from wilderness trails to roads, riverboats, railroads, and civilization. A tribute to the faith, courage, and ingenuity of our hardy pioneers who blazed the trails and made this progress possible. <laughs> A vista into a world of wondrous ideas, signifying man's achievements. I thought I got a signal. Before our preview of Tomorrowland, I'd like to read these few words of dedication. A vista into a world of wondrous ideas, signifying man's achievement. A step into the future with predictions of constructive things to come. Tomorrow offers new frontiers in science, adventure, and ideals. The atomic age, the challenge of outer space, and the hope for a peaceful and unified world. Now the plaque reserved for last. A few words of dedication for the happiest kingdom of them all. Fantasy land. Here is a world of imagination, hopes, and dreams. In this timeless land of enchantment, the age of chivalry, magic, and make believe are reborn, and fairy tales come true. Fantasy land is dedicated to the young and the young in heart, to those who believe that when you wish upon a star, your dreams do come true. <laughs> Well, it seems to me we've been everywhere, haven't we? Well, I, I hope so. I don't know. Say, haven't we missed something? Seems like it. A whole land? Adventure land. Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> Let's go over there. Bob Cummings or somebody ought to be waiting to let us see that. Oh, land. we better hurry. We haven't got much time. Take it away, Adventure Land.
Walt, you've made a bum out of Barnum today, but we've got to go. <laughs> I know, but I just want to say a word of thanks to all the artists, the workers, and everybody that helped make this dream come true. Let's go into Fantasyland and have That's some fun. Go. Goodbye, folks. Disneyland has always had a big river and a Mississippi sternwheeler. It seemed appropriate to create a new attraction at the bend of the river. And so Disneyland's New Orleans Square came into being. A New Orleans of a century ago when she was the gay Paris of the American frontier. In 1803, the United States wanted New Orleans for a port. In order to get it, we had to make a package deal with Napoleon. He insisted that we buy the peripheral area. So we threw in an extra million and ended up with 800,000 square miles. The Louisiana Purchase was probably the greatest real estate deal of all time. It included all of this territory from the Gulf to Canada. Total cost, $11 million. And by the way, Disneyland's New Orleans Square alone cost 15 million. But of course, a dollar went much further in those days. It was a gala day when we officially opened New Orleans Square. We had a real jubilee, Southern style. Aboard the Mark Twain, representatives of the press and other guests got a preview of New Orleans Square as they came down river for the opening ceremonies. architecture and atmosphere of old New Orleans of the 1850s has been retained. The narrow winding streets, intimate courtyards, and the iron lace balconies are authentic in every detail. Special guest was the mayor of the first New Orleans, Louisiana, that is. After the usual dedication speeches, we presented his honor with a key to Disneyland's New Orleans. They say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, but this little fellow here is worth a fortune because we poured a fortune into creating him. Now, the first problem was to make a move. Come on, presto, move. That's it. Come on, show off. Rear back and show off your chest. Look at that. The crown. Cost a heck of a lot of money, so you should live up to it. <laughs> well, actually, it wasn't as simple as that. Just as we had to learn to make our animated cartoons talk, we had to find a way to make these characters talk, too. Now, to accomplish this, we created a new type of animation. So new that we had to invent a new name for it. Audio animatronics? Right, audio animatronics. Audio for sound. See, an electronically animated by sound. That's, That's what it. he's trying to say. Thank you. That's what he's trying to say. Excuse me, Walt. It's okay. How about it? Can you sing? Can I sing? Memories. No. You should see my dance. It is even worse. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Well, as I was saying, work in this new type of animation is going on around the clock to meet the opening date of the fair. For years, birds have given up their feathers to decorate the ladies. But here, we're reversing the procedure. East meets West. It's a small world. And that's the name of our latest attraction at Disneyland. Its stars are the children of the world. Every land from A to Z, from Asia to Zululand is represented. From sketches and finished drawings, these scale models were constructed. Then by our electronic process, which we call uh, audio animatronics, they were given voice and movement. Now this is the scale model of a 30 foot high clock at the small world entrance. 
It's the most unique musical timepiece ever created. At each quarter hour, when its cogs, gears, and springs and wheels are set into motion, the clock actually performs the time. ceremonies of It's a Small World. More than 500 children and old world folk dancers in their native costumes participated in the parade. Dedication ceremonies were attended by consular officials, representatives of the press, and thousands of Disneyland visitors. But the very special guests were children from many nations. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. flown to Disneyland from the major oceans and seas was added to the small world's seven seaways. to the happiest cruise that ever sailed around the world. Outward bound passengers enjoy a close view of these fanciful figures which are shaped from growing trees and shrubs. to the children's world of imagination, fun, and laughter as we start our globe-circling tour in the Scandinavian country. During our voyage, we'll visit more than 100 lands. Let's see how many we can identify. Art means a lot to me in that something will never be finished, something that I can keep developing and adding to. Not only can I add things, but even the trees will keep growing. The thing will get more beautiful every year. Presents... Ladies and gentlemen, Walt Disney. <laughs> the other night I was fortunate enough to attend a lecture on the subject of man's hunting instinct. The lecturer was uh, Professor Ludwig von Drake. The professor had such a dynamic personality, such an unusual viewpoint on this subject, that we invited him over here to repeat his lecture for a color of camera. We fixed the place up to give the professor a suitable uh, atmosphere and uh, setting, for after all, the subject is man's hunting instinct. Good, good, send him in, send him in. Now, before he gets here, let me give you a few quick facts on him. The professor is a brilliant scientist, a world traveler and psychologist. Degrees from Oxford, Cambridge, Heidelberg, no, I forgot to mention, he's actually Donald Duck's uncle. Now, you see, the Drakes 
are the paternal side of the family, the continental branch. They're the eggheads of the clan. The professor being Don's father's brother is a drake, of course. But the best thing about the professor is that unlike Donald, you can understand him. Come in, professor, come in. Good evening, everybody. I am here. The lecture school of Don, I'm Professor Ludwig von Brink. That's who I am. How do you do, professor? I'm... Well, don't, don't tell me. I'm going to tell you. That's Mr. Dilly, isn't that you? Really? Lily? Bisbee? Disney, D-I-S-N-E-Y. <laughs> oh, Disney, of course I knew it all the time. I never forget a face. You're the fellow who works for my nephew, Donald Duck, isn't that right? Yes, I guess you could put it that way. All right, we're ready for the election. Now, where's the audience? That must be the audience. Right out over there, they're very nice. Good. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. Go sit in the audience with the rest. Excuse me, Professor. The audience is over here. All right, now we have that plenty elbow. We set the stage, as they say, I put the projector over here. And we put the, the screen is going to be over there. And we put the spotlight it's on me, because I'm the lecturer. <laughs> May I help you, Professor? You're sure you're going to help me? You're going to sit down and be quiet. That's how you're going to help me. <laughs> audience interruption. All right, now we begin. This is not Santa's workshop. It's just one section of a creative world where new attractions for Disneyland are conceived. Now, a great deal of time, sweat, and a few tears were expended on all this, but there's a lot of satisfaction in developing ideas into realities which become a part of Disneyland. Now, we've just finished the first year of our second decade. It was a big year for the opening of many new attractions. Since they were opened, seven million people have enjoyed them. So we'd like for you to see and enjoy them too. But first, let's turn back the calendar to the beginning of Disneyland's second decade. It all began when the new year started off with a... Well, as you can see, the past year has been a big one for us. It gave us a good start into Disneyland's second decade. But even now, we're uh, thinking ahead and creating new attractions for months and years to come. And speaking of the very near future, we'll be back in one minute to tell you about our next program. Everything in this room may change time and time again as we move ahead. But the basic philosophy of what we're planning for Disney World is going to remain very much as it is right now. We know what our goals are, we know what we hope to accomplish, and believe me, it's the most exciting and challenging assignment we've ever tackled at Walt Disney Productions. Today, I want to share with you some of our ideas for Disney World. Now, the prologue to this film told you some of the philosophy that made Disneyland in California what it is today. Of course, there'll be another amusement theme park in Florida, similar to the one in California. We're now developing a master plan that encompasses the theme park and all the facilities around it that will serve the tourists. Hotels, motels, and a variety of recreation activities. In fact, just this little area alone is five times the size of Disneyland in California. But as you can see on this master plan, the theme park and all the other tourist facilities fill just one small area of our enormous Florida project. According to this scale, I am six miles tall. Now that's 12 miles from here up to here, and the whole area encompasses 27,400 acres. That is 43 square miles, twice the size of the island of Manhattan. Now, the area we propose to develop is between the Greedy Creek Swamp and the Bonnet Creek Swamp. So one thing we don't need is a fence to protect us from trespassers. Here in Florida, we have something special we never enjoyed at Disneyland. 
the blessing of science. There's enough land here to hold all the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. Right now, our plans include an airport of the future down here in Osceola County, an entrance complex where all visitors will enter Disney World, an industrial park area covering about 1,000 acres, and of course, the theme park area way up here. And all these varied activities around the Disney World will be tied together by a high-speed rapid transit system running almost the full length of the property. The most exciting, the far the most important part of our Florida project, in fact, the heart of everything we'll be doing in Disney World will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. We call it EPCOT, spelled E-P-C-O-T, Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. Here it is in larger scale. Epcot will take its cue from the new ideas and new technologies that are now emerging from the creative centers of American industry. It will be a community of tomorrow that will never be completed, but will always be introducing and testing and demonstrating new materials and new systems. And Epcot will always be a showcase. You'd really be thrilled at all the comments that have been made this evening concerning Disney pictures. It's just a marvelous thing. They tell me this could be one of your biggest pictures, Mr. Disney. Well, we haven't retired yet, you know. You never know what's coming. That's right. Very nice to see you. There's just two words. He's coming to our microphone now. Walt Disney, ladies and gentlemen. Let me hear it. Hello, Walt. How are you? Hello. How do you do? How's everything going? Walt, it's just been the greatest night that I've ever seen in Hollywood, and I've been here 33 years. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Tell me, Walt, is, how long is it since you had a world premiere? Well, of course, the big, uh, the big important premiere was uh, Snow White, but we had a couple after that. You know? Just one after Snow White, Fantasia, wasn't that all? Can you tell us a little about what you did at the World's Fair? Well, uh, no film at the World's Fair. It was a new technique. Uh, we call it audio animatronics. It's where we animate the human figure. It's an uh, animated robot in a way, very natural. They put on shows, talk, dialogue, and everything. Well, people that have seen him just say that it's fabulous. Just fabulous. See, I'm looking up, and I see something happening in the sky. Here comes Mary Poppins now. That's the only way she'd come, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Julie Andrews, Mary Poppins. Hi, how are you? I'm just wonderful. It's so good to have the star and the storyteller. I can stand here and ask Julie a hundred questions. Please but don't. I won't. Is this the first motion picture that you've made here in Hollywood? Completely. The first motion picture I've made anywhere. Have you ever worked for a nicer man? Never. And I don't think I ever will again either. How did you pick Julie for the part? Well, uh, I went uh, to New York and I caught the performance of Camelot. Of course, I'd heard the records and things, but it was Camelot that I saw her in. And then I went backstage and I tried to talk her into the thing and... Uh, I tried to convince her I was uh, capable of making a, a picture with uh, live actors as well as cartoons. I didn't know what she thought of me and everything. I think I put on quite a, uh, an act there that night, didn't I? I'm really impressed, Walt. <laughs>
want to tell you that Mary Poppins is inside waiting to meet you. Now, nice people, go in and say hello to Mary Poppins. I'd give anything to be there with you. But this seems to be one of those times I'm tied down here at the studio night and day. Of course, it's always this way when we're shooting a picture. And it so happens we're in the middle of shooting one right now. It's a comedy feature called uh, Blackbeard's Ghost, starring uh, Peter Ustinoff, Dee Jones, and Susan Plachette. Now, we've completed quite a few pictures since finishing Follow Me Boy. But there's one special one that I just have to mention. It's titled The uh, Happiest Million. Now, this is one we call a happy family musical. It's the true story of the fabulous Anthony Drexel Biddle family of Philadelphia in the era of 1917. Now, the stars are Fred McMurray, a real Disney favorite, as Mr. Biddle, the lovely Greer Garson as Mrs. Biddle, two newcomers, Leslie Ann Warren and John Davidson, playing Cordelia Biddle and Angie Duke. And it was the romance between these two that brought together the, together the Bill and Duke family. And introducing the fabulous Tommy Steele, star of the Broadway hit Half a Sixpence. Tommy plays the part of John Lawless, the butler. Now there's a sequence in the picture that I'd like very much to run for you. It's that part where Tommy, fresh off the boat from Ireland, has been sent by an employment agency to the Biddle home to apply for the job as butler. He walks in unannounced, and this is what happened. Well, that's just one of the many songs in the show. And naturally, being part Irish, it's one of my favorites, of course. Now, The Happiest Millionaire won't be released until late next year. So let's get on with the business at hand, and that is Follow Me Boy. To us, this is a very special kind of motion picture, and one of which we're very proud. It has a fine cast, and uh, oh yes, you're about to meet a 15-year-old boy for whom I predict a great acting future. His name is Kurt Russell. I hope you enjoy the show, and incidentally, have a handkerchief handy. If you're like me, you're not only going to laugh a lot, but you're going to shed a few happy tears. So thanks for coming, and again, I'm sorry I can't be there with you personally for this occasion, but here now is Follow Me Boy. For so that, um, it's, it's very difficult to talk about rewards, because certainly you, you've had so many of them, 29 Oscars and nearly 700 other awards from all corners of the world, but personally, what, what has been your greatest reward? Date. Well, my greatest reward, I think, is that uh, I've been able to build this wonderful organization, been able to enjoy good health, and uh, the way I feel today, I feel like uh, I can still go on being a part of this thing after 40-some-odd years in the business, and uh, also to have the, the public uh, appreciate and accept what I've done all these years. That, that is a great reward. I'm sure it is. It, it seems unlikely, but if, if you had it to do over again, would you do any part of it differently? Well, if I had it to do over again, uh, I think, uh, no, I don't think it would. <laughs> I don't know. I hope I don't have to do it over again. <laughs> <laughs> There's certainly a, a, a completely unique reward in having that feeling about your work and what you've accomplished. Yes. That's, You're right. that's a reward of satisfaction and happiness. Surely. Yes. What what does happiness mean to you? Well, of course, I mean happiness is a state of mind. I mean that you can, if you're of your own doing, you can be happy or you can be unhappy. It's just according to the way you look at things, you know. So I think happiness is a, a, well contentment, but it doesn't mean you have to have wealth. All individuals are different. So I was, uh, wouldn't be satisfied with just carrying out a routine job and, and being happy. Uh, yet I, I, I envy those people. I, I had a brother who, who uh, I really envied because 
He was a mailman. But he had all the fun. He had himself a trailer, and he used to go off and go fishing, and he didn't worry about payrolls and, and stories and, and picture grocers or anything. And he, he was the happy one. I, I always said, he's the smart Disney. <laughs> We're now steaming back to our own time and to Main Street Station, gateway to Disneyland. If you'll be leaving us here, stay in your seat till we come to a full stop. And remember to gather all your personal belongings, including the young'uns if you got any, and step carefully from the train. I'd especially like to thank those of you who've been with me for the Grand Circle Tour of Disneyland. We surely hope you enjoyed your travels with us and that you'll come back and see us again real soon. For those of you traveling on, we'll be on our way again in just a few minutes. This is Main Street Station. Main Street, USA.